Hello, everyone. Welcome to Reiki Radio. I am your host, Yolanda Williams, and we have an interesting guest to share with you today, a very interesting topic. In fact, it's one that I've received emails about for years, ever since starting the podcast. However, I've never had a guest on to explore the topic of dreams. So if you are someone who is curious about your own dreams, wondering why we dream in the first place, wondering how your dreams may be of use, you're really going to enjoy this episode. So our guest today, her name is Teresa Chung, and she's a best-selling author and dream decoding expert who has been researching and writing about spirituality, astrology, dreams, and the paranormal for the last 25 years. And she has written over 40 books in fact, um, it was interesting when I found out that I'd be interviewing her, I thought like, wow, her name sounds so familiar. And it turns out I have one of her books that she co-authored called The Premonition Code. And we will talk a little bit about this today. Um, this is about the science of precognition. And we also talk about just a little bit her most recent book, which is all about angels, and it's called The Truth About Angels. So over these last um, 25 years, like I said, she's written over 40 books. I mean, she's written about tarot, astrology, dreams, all of these things. And she does give us some interesting tips of how to work on recalling our dreams, using our dreams for our own form of therapy, and so much more. So I hope you enjoy the conversation. If you would like to learn more about Teresa and her work, be sure to visit her website, TeresaChung.com. And her last name is spelled C-H-E-U-N-G. And I will, of course, have the links for her website and how to reach her on social media all down in the show description. So I hope that you enjoy the conversation. Share your thoughts with me. I would love to hear from you. And I'll see you on the other side. Okay, hello. Welcome to Reiki Radio, everyone. We have an amazing guest today, Teresa Chung. Um, Teresa, before we get into our topic of dreams, and honestly, you have such an amazing body of work. I'm sure we'll talk about a few other things as well. Um, I want to first thank you for coming on Reiki Radio, and thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you. Oh, well, thank you for having me and thank you for all that you do. It's uh, very exciting for me to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Love. My mind is already flipping with all of the questions. I was excited to have this conversation <laughs> Yay. with you. Yay. That's, that's why I'm trying to, okay, just settle and focus. So as I um, mentioned, you do have an extraordinary body of work and you've written more books than I think anyone could possibly imagine writing in their lifetime. But you are going to talk to us today about dreams yes. and but you also um speak a lot about and um educate people a lot about i saw you have a new book about angels you also have the book that i have of yours the premonition code um and there, again it's just so many facets under the the umbrella of spirituality so I wanted to ask first, what even got you into this work? How did you come into this path? I was kind of born into it. I was born into a family of spiritualists and psychics and astrologers, traveling family. So it was normal for me to believe in a spiritual aspect to our lives or that there's more to this life than meets the eye. It just was natural but then of course when I went to Cambridge University I was blessed to be offered a place there to read religion because I was always drawn to finding meaning in life I began to realize that my upbringing was slightly alternative and not everybody felt the same so I went on a journey really and and um, after leaving Cambridge became more spiritual than religious um, because I saw such beauty in all religions and um, and then was just blessed to get opportunity after opportunity to write books about what I love. And I guess the reason I am so eclectic in this area is because my first big success 20 or so years ago now was HarperCollins asked me to write an encyclopedia 
of the psychic world. And these were in the days when you had these doorstop of a book. It was a massive A to Z of everything psychic. And then they asked me to do a big encyclopedia of 20,000 dreams and then a big encyclopedia of birthdays. And that made me kind of the writer I am today because I saw when I was doing these massive, massive books, I saw how interconnected everything was. And whether you're talking about precognition, hauntings, angels, afterlife, dreaming, it's all from the same source. And that's what I've tried to show. I, I don't like being put in a specific not box. It's like she's the afterlife lady or she's the numerology lady or she's tarot. It's all, and I study it all and hopefully could have an informed opinion about it all. And my mission these days, I'm leading with dreams simply because the lockdown dream phenomenon has increased interest in dreaming as never before. But my mission is to mainstream it and show that it's very, very simple, really. I think we overcomplicate these things and make them look esoteric and difficult to understand. I'm trying to show people it's a part, a natural part of life because it is a natural part of my life. And I hopefully I'm not too eccentric. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's really interesting. I love what you said about, you know, not necessarily being put into a box of I am the astrology lady or the angel lady, but it, it reminds me of what you said at the very beginning of, you know, finding the beauty in all different religions. It sounds like your work and the experiences that you have had really kind of bring you back to that, that essence of connectivity that we all talk about and, and are trying to understand in so many ways. So it's Absolutely. really beautiful. You've got it. And of course, dreams, perhaps more than anything else, illustrate that interconnection because whoever you are, whatever your age, whatever your political belief, whatever stage in life you are, you are going to dream. They illustrate yeah. what unites us. Yes. We are all dreaming beings. So that's where I guess I want to start because, you know, I think we all have so many questions about dreams and, um, you know, I really would love to hear even just your point of view, even if it's not, you know, necessarily science has been able to prove it yet, but just in a very, you know, generalized way, what are dreams and where do we go? What do you, what do you think? Where do we go? Oh, what a fantastic question. And I could I could talk for hours about that. I could go through scientists are trying to answer that question. And to date, they don't know. Right. You know, it's not for want of trying. They know more about the craters of the moon than they do about dreams and why we have them. They're all these theories that they're just the brain offloading and et cetera, et cetera. But none of them are satisfying enough. And I have come to the conclusion after all the research, I mean, I've been researching them forever dreams and writing about them, that they are a form of internal therapy to help us evolve and heal. They are, they, we, we sleep to dream, I believe dreams, are extremely important for our evolution and for sorting out, understanding ourselves better, for healing traumas, and for connecting us to the part of ourself which is beyond the material. I mean, in some cultures, of course, they believe that when you enter the land of the dreams, you are in the afterlife, the spirit. Mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure whether that's the case. I never ever say I know for sure, because who am I to say that? I don't know, I could be wrong. I suspect it is. I suspect that dreams are the, the, the bridge. Yeah. They are the bridge where we, and, and then in the world of the dream, we can be or do anything. We can meet all aspects of ourselves and also heal all aspects of ourselves. And it's such an untapped resource. And um, as I say, I'm, I'm on a mission to make people fall in love with their dreams because when they fall in love with their dreams, even the shadows and the nightmares, they fall in love with themselves. Yes. So there's two different things I want to talk to you about. One about the actual journey in dreams, but you bring up this beautiful idea of it being this form of therapy. So of yeah. course, so many of us, you know, we wake up and Sometimes there are dreams where it seems it's very reflective of our life. Like we wake up and we're like, oh yeah, that made complete sense. I understand why I dreamt that. But then we have those dreams that maybe are full of symbolism or they just make no sense to us. Weird. So how do we, one, what are the types of dreams? And then how do we start to interpret them? 
How you start in interpreting them, the rule of thumb is to think that when you go into the world of the dream, first of all is to understand that they don't speak literally, mm -hmm. like a dog or a cat in a dream actually isn't a dog or a cat as we understand it in waking life. It's symbolic. We have to start thinking in terms of symbols and metaphors. And that's the big shift when people realize that First of all, it's not literal. If you dream, have a dream about a crash, it's not, in most cases, I mean, there are exceptions, we'll talk about that with the premonition code. If you dream of a crash, it's not a crash in real life. It's symbolic. It, it's using the symbolism of a crash to try and wake you up to something in your waking life. So that's the rule of thumb. First of all, think in symbols and metaphors. Like if you dream of a dog, what do I think about dogs in waking life? You know, for most of us, it's loyalty, it's love, unconditional love and it's companionship, right? So that's the personal association. However, if, if you're frightened of dogs, it can mean fear and anxiety. So you've got to look at your personal association. You've also, the second thing and perhaps the most important is to understand you are dreaming yourself. Everything in your dream from the storyline to the emotions, to the colors, to the people in it, to the things, is an aspect of you symbolic in symbol, symbolic form. Okay. So basically you're dreaming yourself, even the parts that you don't want to admit to in waking life. And dreams are showing you these parts and offering you an opportunity to ask questions of them, meet, meet them, ask questions and, and learn from them so that you wake up with a new perspective. Every dream you have is trying to offer you a perspective on your waking life. And that's what you need to do. You need to wake up. When you wake up in the morning and think, that dream I had about a monster or something, um, what in my waking life resonates, right? What mm -hmm. kind of monster was it? Was it a zombie, which is dead? Or was it a living monster? You know, if it's a dead monster, it could ref uh, refer to routine or something which has lost the passion. But if it's a living monster, it could be like anger or something very, you've got to work like a detective. But it won't just be one dream. Again, a mistake people make is that they think they have one dream and then they've got to go away and, and interpret it. Yes, of course, but dreams work in a series like Netflix. You've got to tune in oh, yeah. for the next night. And sometimes a dream the following night will give you insight into the dream you had before. But above all, your dreams, you are absolutely right, are a commentary on your waking life. And your dream will choose symbols from your waking life that it feels will resonate most with you. If you think of all the things we experience in our waking life, all the people we see on television, all the words we hear, why does your dreaming mind select some of them and not others? And it's for a reason, because it feels that that's the most effective way to get a message across to you. And it, if you don't understand that message, it will try a different way. That's why sometimes recurring dreams can escalate into nightmares, because it no, a nightmare is something you're going to pay attention to, because that's all your dreaming mind wants at the end of the day is for you to pay attention to it. It wants to grab your attention. And sometimes it will do that in very shocking ways, like crash dreams, accidents, cheating, death, nightmares. But every single one of them, and I, I tell every people, even nightmares are a gift, a self-knowledge gift. So think of your dreams as your nocturnal, internal therapist. And I love cheat. that. Because when you go to therapy, the therapist just asks, gets you to question right. your assumptions. They will say, well, how does that make you feel? You know, that's what your dreams are doing to you all the time. You, you know, it's much cheaper than real therapy. <laughs> well, I like that you mentioned that part of how you feel, because when you, well, one, just highlighting that you mentioned that with the symbolism, while there may be um, a general thought of what different things represent and what they symbol symbolize, we really have to trust what it means to us. But say there's a symbol or a character or a thing, and it really doesn't mean anything to us. Is that what we, how we identify the translation is through how it made us feel? Is that like a way to kind of crack the code of? Feelings are 
are very important. I also use the technique of association, right? If a okay. fork appears in your dream and you have no emotional attachment to a fork, why am I dreaming of forks? Go and do some research. That's what I say. When, once you fall in love with your dreams, life becomes so interesting. Go and Google forks, the history of forks, what they're used for. You know, are you stabbing yourself or others? Um, all the associations, go through them all surrounding forks, do some research and then when the right association hits, you will get this kind of calm knowing, like a light bulb moment. And that's how you know it's the right interpretation. Because you'll go through all these ones, because you know, dreams can mean many different things. And the encyclopedias I write offer standard universal interpretations of common symbols. But of course, mm -hmm. your personal association is what matters the most. So go through all these universal associations and eventually, something will strike a chord. If it doesn't, go to bed the next night and ask your dreaming mind saying, look, what you're giving me I'm not, is not making sense. I want some more clarity. You can talk to your dreaming mind like that. It's not insane, it's something you can do. I talk to my dreaming mind all the time if I'm having an issue or, or wanting to know what the next best move is. I say, please send me a dream. Yeah, that can it's interesting too give though, me that, new that I'm sorry, that you mentioned it being sometimes like a Netflix series, because I think a lot of us also have that experience <laughs> of there are certain places or things that are reoccurring in dreams and not necessarily, you know, um, night after night, but there's just this theme. So in that, is it important for us to record the dreams? Like, how do you recommend or what tips do you have for us to where we can start doing the investigation? How do we work with our dreams? So much, because I'm so deep in the dream world. I forget often the absolute fundamentals. And thank you so much for pointing that out. I'm, I'm guilty as charged when I talk about dreams to forget to tell people, yes, the most important thing to do is to write them down. Because if you don't, you will forget. And you need to write them down immediately on waking. Because, you know, when you become conscious, the, the subtle world language of the unconscious can't compete with mm -hmm. materialism and with waking reality it's too subtle so you need to really in the morning write down those images and reflections and, and if you start getting into the habit of doing that dream recall will become much easier um, because it becomes a ritual that you do every morning so yes absolutely write it down and don't stress about interpreting it straight away in the morning I mean you've got a busy day to go go and look at it in the evening before you go to bed and that's really good because if you go to bed associating with dreams and thinking about dreams you're more likely to dream again and that's the time to reflect on your dreams and decode their meaning you know later in the day or ideally before you go to bed but yes write them down and i i have kept dream journals i think i started in my teens and i still got them and it's hilarious to look back how sometimes i've i've seen a kind of like an alternative world playing out there yeah. and it's so complementary to what's been happening in my waking reality sometimes I can't see it at the time but then a few years later in hindsight I can think my dreaming mind was so warning me my dreaming mind just knew what was real there yeah. you know it was trying to to send me a message and I was not ready to hear it and that's a wonderful thing to do because then you can you can start realizing that your dreaming mind has your back. You know, life's tough and we all want a loyal companion, a loyal person who loves us, whatever we do. That's your dreaming mind. It's got your back. It is your best friend. It will tell you the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts, you know, but that's what a good friend does. They tell you the truth. And well, that's what you dreams don't lie. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and that's the interesting thing. I'm sure a lot of people listening are probably going to be like, oh my goodness, okay, so I have to start interpreting this because I think we can be dismissive sometimes of dreams, especially when we don't understand um, what it is that if the message isn't so direct and clear. So this will be fun to play with. But I want to ask then too, what are the different types of dreams? Oh, the different types of dreams. Well, of course, you have mm -hmm. nightmares, mm -hmm. which are extreme dreams where your dreaming mind has got a bit fed up. You're not getting the messages it's sending. So it sends you this big hitting, you know, anxiety making dream. You can have afterlife dreams where you, you know, maybe connect with people on the other side. I don't know. But the great majority of dreams are psychological and symbolic, as I say. And within that category, 
I would say 98% of dreams are in that category of symbolic and psychological. There are lots of different strands like healing dreams, cathartic dreams, wish fulfillment dreams. You can go through it. But for me, I just lump them in psychological and symbolic. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to complicate it with all, all the different categories, but there are, and I put them in, in my books if you're, if you're interested, you know, processing yeah. dreams, all, all sorts of different categories within that but they all are united by the fact that they have they are symbolic and psychological and their sole purpose is to help you understand yourself and your waking life better mm -hmm. so do you personally think especially with all the research and the work that you've done that when we're dreaming is it just like an altered state of consciousness or do you think that we're really literally maybe experiencing a different realm like do we're you have any we're in a different state of awareness i mean mm -hmm. contrary to what most people think we don't actually sleep a part of our brain stays awake all the time yeah and it's that it, we're actually it's still us you know people think when they go to sleep that, that you know they check out they don't part of you stays deeply alert and that's what what is dream. it's you when you're dreaming you're still you but you're exploring the unconscious aspect of yourself, the spiritual aspect of yourself, the part of you that sees the bigger picture and knows you better than anyone else. And it's such a shame that a lot of people are afraid to get intimate with that part. Mm -hmm. Because when they do get intimate with it and start really loving it, miracles can happen. Self-belief happens, right? Because in dreams, you can literally be or do anything. Yes. You know, yes. and you can become aware in your dreams as well and wake up in them. That's lucid dreaming. That's something that can happen. The more you work with dreams, you become more, you know, you're dreaming. And that's an incredible, incredible feeling. You know, I wanted to ask you a little more about that, because that is something that, you know, comes up a lot. People are curious about lucid dreaming, um, even teaching themselves how to do this. But can you explain for people who may have no idea what lucid dreaming is? What oh, is it exactly, please? It's the biggest high. I mean, for me as a spiritual author, researcher, writer, it's the biggest high. Uh, it's when it starts with a non-lucid dream, just a regular dream, when suddenly something happens in that dream, like you grow 10 fingers on one hand or you become a bird or whatever, and you suddenly think, wait a minute, this is a dream. This, is, this just, just doesn't happen. And then you know you're dreaming when you're dreaming, like the movie Inception with Leonardo DiCaprio, yeah. you know, he popularized it. You know you're dreaming when you're dreaming. It's such a ride because then you can bring whatever you want into that dream. You can fly. I love flying when it happens to me. You can meet whoever you want. You can role play. And when you wake up the next morning, you literally feel like anything's possible. And that mm -hmm. confidence can carry into your waking life it's almost like if you can dream it you can do it it's not a cliche it's true um and it's a wonderful wonderful skill that i wish more people would treat themselves to it's not that difficult because a lot of us had lucid dreams when we were children so it's not something you need to learn how to do you need to remember how to do it because we lose touch with that side of ourselves that can suspend disbelief and 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 trust in the unseen and so, you know, the tips I give for people to, 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 um, who want to lucid dream is first of all, during the day, get into the habit of noticing your environment more, be much more mindful. For example, I, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, am I talking to you, Landa, or is it a dream? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I start questioning that a lot so that it becomes ingrained in me to question my reality, is this, Reality, is this a dream? I slap my, I'm, I'm awake, I hope I'm awake. <laughs> Maybe it is a dream. <laughs> so what happens, the more I get into the habit of doing that, because dreams reflect your waking life, sooner or later in a dream, you're gonna do it too. So that's, that's the biggest, the, the, the most, you know, practical way to become more lucid as a dreamer. Um, the mindful approach to life, setting the intention to dream, say, before you go to bed at night, say, I want to know I'm dreaming when I'm dreaming because I want to discover my hidden potential, mm. you know? Because I say, in waking life, we do just show the tip of the iceberg and dreams show us that we are not 
we are so much more than we think we are. And, yeah. and they also show us that we are so much more interesting and creative than we think we are. Um, well, it's really and, uh, interesting hearing you, say, that. hearing you say this because it sounds like, I mean, you did mention at the beginning that dreams in a way, it can be therapy for us, but it sounds almost like mm. this, this playground where we really get to interact with our yeah. subconscious mind. And so with the nightmares, say something fearful comes up. So then maybe because you were so afraid, but you survived, you've already encountered whatever that fear is. Maybe you were trying to avoid in your waking state yes. or um, the experience of like what you just said, I don't know, I have a dream where I did something, maybe I don't have the audacity to do or the confidence to do in my waking life. But in the dream, I experience it. So somewhere in me, now that's imprinted the possibility. Yeah. Yeah, your brain doesn't actually know the difference between right. waking and sleep. So if you've done something in a dream, your brain kind of thinks you've already done it. And convincing your brain that you can do something is the, is the first step to actually doing it, believing you can do it. And if you do it successfully in your dream, you know, you incubate a dream so that you do do the, the interview or, 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 or the job interview or whatever you're nervous about successfully, your brain's kind of rehearsed you for that. So that when it happens in waking life, you, you can relax because you, your brain thinks you've got this. Because mm -hmm. often so much in waking life, the reason things don't work out is we don't believe in ourselves. Right. You know, yeah. dreams, just, just dreams are really just trying to help us believe in ourselves give us that, that adrenaline rush and also show us that life is, should be fun. Life is, is filled with creative opportunities for us to explore. And we limit ourselves so much in, in waking reality with our negative thoughts and trying to run after the expectations of others. In the dream world, the dream, dreams show us that it doesn't matter about the expectations of others. It's what you create that matters. And that's, okay. that's a big life lesson to learn. But dreams are help, trying to help us do that all the time. We have an inbuilt therapist, as I say, trying to help us. This is really <laughs> fascinating. I mean, it's, it's such an interesting conversation. I'm thankful that you came to have it because I'm sure it's helping a lot of us look at dreams in a different way. And again, not necessarily something to be dismissive of, but really to come into a different relationship with that aspect of ourselves, I guess you would say, but I have to ask you this. Um, last night, I was thinking about this conversation with you and thinking of, the, you know, these questions, like, what do we all wonder about? Where do we go? What kind of dreams and these things? And then I remembered, and I don't know if this is part of your work, but I used to experience a lot of what people um, call, oh, I always forget what it's called now. Um, sleep paralysis. And yes. over the years, I've spoken to other people who have had the encounter. But what they say scientifically, a lot of people who have experienced it, and including myself, are like, no, 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 you don't understand. I mean, it's, it's this weird, and I, I have this commonly, not, even this experience of either when I'm about to go to sleep or I'm coming out of sleep. It's literally this feeling of either leaving or returning and like feeling that, that. You are, you are, um, and, and it's wonderful that you have this awareness of this. And I would mm -hmm. encourage you to actually be curious about that state. Not, not, I'm sure you don't fear it, but to actually study it. And when it happens, try and stay alert mentally, but let your body fall asleep. Don't fight it. A lot of people panic because it's a natural yes. thing because when you fall asleep, your body needs to kind of be frozen mm -hmm. to stop you acting out your dreams and it'd be dangerous. So it's yes. actually perfectly natural state. It's also sleep paralysis can be a precursor to a, a lucid dream. If, you, if you're aware of that and you keep that aware, it is, I know this sounds weird, but to consciously fall asleep. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is in yogic traditions. I think it's Nidra yoga where you are, you are, aware that you're falling asleep that your body is but your mind your brain stays conscious 
Yeah. So it is possible. It is possible to do that. And it shows that you're very, very close to that state. So I would celebrate. First uh -huh. of all, I would absolutely enjoy the sleep paralysis. And a lot of people panic with it. And then that just yeah. makes it, 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 all the potential goes away when you bring fear into it. It's nothing to fear. It is natural. It's what happened to all of us when we fall asleep, but most of us just, you know, get knocked out. We don't become aware of it. We're yeah. not I, tuned into our unconscious as you clearly are. Most of us actually just block it out and aren't consciously aware of it. The fact that you are is very, very exciting. Yeah, well, you know, I have to say, admittedly, when it first started, it was terrifying because it, it feels like, as if like some part of you is trying to leave your body. And so oh I think, goodness. yes. And like your body, it almost feels like it's vibrating oh and you goodness. can't, yeah, you can't move, but yeah. you're, you're aware. Enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Stay calm and notice it. What you should do is note, how am I feeling? And, and let your mind go through your body and how you're feeling and, and don't, don't panic. It is perfect. Stay calm. It is perfectly normal and natural. It's what happens to all of us when we fall asleep, but the great majority of us don't become consciously aware of it. We just zone out. Okay. Oh, I know you, there's going to be you know, a lot of emails. <laughs> you, you, you're tuned into it. Um, yeah. So as, as I say, if you, you might want to try some yoga nidra, techniques where they stay <laughs> conscious when it's contradictory but it is possible that's okay very interesting I'm sure so many people are going to email about this because I know a lot of people who experience it I mean who do you talk to about it really and it's it's a it's a strange thing but then does that lead into for some people and this is kind of going in another direction but even the p possibility of astral travel like our some people more likely to be able to project out of their body when they're in that in-between state because the body is so relaxed? I, I mean, basically for me, astral travel um, <laughs> is different from dreaming because in dreaming, you stay in your body. Um, whether people actually leave their bodies is something that I'm, I haven't, I can't go there. I don't, necessarily believe that I think it is all us um, dreaming mm -hmm. that we are leaving our body however of course near-death experiences where people have an out of -dodd body experience where the spirit leaves their body so it is entirely possible but it's a separate category astral travel and lucid dreaming are not the same thing lucid dreaming vivid dreams all you are very safe you're in your body now I the astral travel out of body experiences tend to be associated with near death experiences where, but the connection to the body always remains. You cannot be disconnected from your body. So don't panic again. If you do think you have an out of body experience, stay calm. You will always be reconnected to your body. You know, mm -hmm. stay calm, enjoy it, observe. Don't panic. I, I mean, panic is the, the greatest dream disappearer ever. Just yeah. stay calm. But it is it is different. I, I can't, you know, astral travel and dreaming are two separate, separate okay. things. And I've, I've written a books, loads of books about near-death experiences where I talk in depth about out-of-body experiences as a different category to, mm -hmm. to dreams. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I guess if you ever make a link between the two or explore that more, I would love to hear about it just because again, um, of different experiences uh, that I've encountered. And I know other people who listen to the show have because I've gotten a lot of emails over the years about dreams and you're really the first guest to come on to talk about dreams. Yay. But within <laughs> that, all of these other, you know, subcategories. Yeah, astral travel and up. dreaming, however, are separate. Um, um, uh, you know, it, it, lucid dreaming, people think that it's astral travel. It's not, you are very much within the dream, within your body, you know, you don't leave it. It's uh -huh. all in your mind and your brain. Um, yeah. Astral travel suggests that you leave your body. However, of course, there's very little proof that that happens. And it's not just a visualization or, you know, overactive imagination. But however, near-death experiences do show that potentially when the body is close to death, 
that may happen. And some people in states of meditation claim to be able to do it. Yeah. But again, these are areas, you know, I, I do try to look at the science. It's so hard to scientifically prove mm -hmm. what's going on there. But, you know, I look forward to studying it more, finding out what scientists say about it, because it's been reported too many times now. Right. To, yeah. To be, uh, you know, it's data uh, that yes. par paranormal experiences are possible. Well, it's interesting that you bring up uh, even the near death experiences because I know, you know, some people believe that sleep is in a way like a form of death. Um, yeah. Obviously not the physical death in the way that we may think of it when we hear the word, but has that come up in your research as well? Or even yeah. what that means, what that really means? Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of people, you know, the Para tribe um, believe that sleep is a form of death. And because of that, they only nap. Oh. And if they... <laughs> And if they do sleep for longer than a few, than an hour or so, they actually call themselves by a different name the next morning. Oh, wow. They have been reborn again. So, you know, <laughs> and they refer to the person they were before their big sleep as him or her. I find that so interesting. I mean, one of the reasons they, they only nap is because of fear of snakes um, as well. However, that, that tribe is very interesting because, um, you know, there's very, they're called the happiest tribe on earth as well. So very, very interesting. But, <laughs> but yeah, you, you could say that sleep is a form that every night, you know, you are dying mm -hmm. in some way and reborn anew because our body replenishes as well, you know, our skin right. cells and everything are, you know, and um, yes, we could, be, it is a mini death, could well be a mini death. Very interesting. So one last thing before we move on to some other questions, I would like to ask you different topics. Is there anything people can do to support dream recall? Because there are some people that are like, yeah, I just, I can't really remember them. And I know you said the practice of making a ritual even of waking up in the morning, making sure we write things down. But if I'm someone who thinks for whatever reason, I don't dream, is there a way to work through that? Absolutely. Number one, writing down anything, it's just a word, an image that comes every morning. But just listening to this episode may well trigger dream recall because your dreams, like anything else in life, respond to the amount of attention and respect you give it. Now, if you have a, say you had a friend who'd been trying to text you for years and every time they did, you ignored it. After a while, that friend would stop texting. And it's the same with your dreaming mind. It gives up after a while. If every morning you wake up and you're too busy to, to, to connect with it, or when it does send you a message, you just think that's a load of rubbish. Mm -hmm. So you need to change your attitude to dreaming. You need to take dreams seriously, treat them with respect, and think about them more. Think about the possibility of dreaming. Read books about the like, like the Wizard of Oz, watch a movie like the Wizard of Oz, which is a big dream or, 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 you know, inception. Think about dreaming because like anything in life, dreams respond to the level of attention you pay to them. If during your day, you're never thinking about the possibility of dreaming, you don't take your dreams seriously, of course you're not gonna recall them. So that, that I think the biggest shift for dream recall is, is attitude. But mm -hmm. also stress can, can limit dream recall. So take, pay attention to your sleep hygiene you know, because you need REM sleep, you know, that's when most dreaming happens is in the rapid eye movement stage sleep. So, you know, um, you need a good night's sleep. You need to feel, you know, calm. You need your bedroom to be calm. You need it to be like a, a dream sanctuary. If your bedroom's decluttered and noisy and you're not sleeping well, you know, dream recall, it's gonna be harder. So you've got to love sleep as well. You've got to enjoy, you know, falling asleep. Um, so dream journaling, change your attitude towards them. And before you go to bed also at night, talk to the pillow, <laughs> say, I'd like to have a dream tonight and I'd like it to be fun. Let the last thing before you go to sleep be, I'd like to dream, you know, set the I, intention to dream and it, don't expect it to happen overnight. Don't get angry with yourself if the next morning nothing happens, just give it time. And I'm telling you, if you keep just gently thinking about the possibility of dreaming, gently thinking you know dreams do matter yeah. dreams are good for me read the research about dream recall it shows that it's psychologically healthy 
studies show that people who have poor dream recall can be more prone to anxiety oh, and depression. Okay. Um, and of course, if we're deprived of REM sleep, death is fairly rapid. So dreams are psychologically healthy. So even if you, and also remind yourself that even if you don't recall your dreams, you are still dreaming. People think, always say to me, I don't dream. So get rid of that. You do, you're a dreaming being. You've just got out of the habit of remembering them. That's all. You're just not remembering them. They're happening. They're still working away on your behalf. So maybe unconsciously, you know, a part of you is absorbing them. But, you know, you, you just need to get into the habit of remembering them. We all had vivid dreams as a child. You just need to, to remember how to do it again. I like the idea of creating the dream sanctuary because yes. I think that too, um, maybe just being more mindful before we go to bed. Like taking the time to make sure maybe we calm ourselves before we even try to get into the bed. And I guess even that could become a ritual, like whatever it is that you do to create an environment of relaxation, turn off the TV, put the phone yeah. way away. Screens. Screens actually, I mean, I do recommend in my books, you know, you know, good at least half an hour before bed, no more screens, no more phones, yeah. you know, read a book, um, write in your journal, you know, just relax, you know, because you, yeah. screens, you know, it's because also very, screens, you're very, very um, passive when you look at a screen. It's all the information is given to you. In dreams, you're highly creative. It comes from you. So it's, you know, I think we spend a lot of time on screens and having everything, you know, on our newsfeed given to us without, it's too passive. Uh, I, I also, if you want to dream more, you know, reading is very good and uh, thinking, learning, being curious, being mindful, these are all ingredients for a really active dream life. And it's not a waste of time because the more active your dream life, you wake up, you know, with all these thoughts and all these exciting things you want to discover and find out the meaning of, yes. you know, life becomes more interesting. Um, well, I have to ask, because you do have more than one book on dreams. So you have the Dream Encyclopedia, you have a book I saw called um, Night Vision. Is yep, that, right. Yes, Night Visions. And so what, which of these books do you recommend for who? I mean, I imagine the dictionary could just be for everybody across the board. But the book about Night Visions, what is that? And who might that be for? That is an interesting collaboration between myself and an artist, uh, Les Chazain, who's very, very talented French artist. Same with my dream decoder packs, because, you know, most of us <laughs> dreams and art and creativity are so linked. Um, so what the artist has done is used my words to create beautiful images for wow. people to ponder and reflect and meditate on before they go to to sleep. And a lot of us say, well, I'm not an artist, I'm not creative, but what I say is, well, every, all of us, all of us can't be great artists, but all of us can dream. And in our dreams, we can create amazing scenarios, stories, art, feelings, emotions, everything. Um, and so that, that's it. If you are someone who's a more of a visual person, that's for you. Night vision is a beautiful kind of a gift, but a, a really, condense in introduction to ba the basics of dream interpretation, but you've also treated to a super talented artist. And the dream decoder pack with artist, the artist is Harriet Merriam, and um, it was published by an art publisher, Lawrence King, who specialize in art. And of course- And this is like a deck of cards, just- a deck of cards. <laughs> right. The 60 most common dreams. And you can look at the image and then turn it over and see a standard interpretation. And the mm -hmm. idea is that if you know how to interpret the 60 most common dreams, these are dreams you're most likely to have because it's based on research. Like the most common dream, for example, is falling, flying, being late, being chased, cheating, death drowning. These are all very, very common dream scenarios which recur over and over again. If you understand the basic tools of how to ter interpret those, you can go away and interpret everything. Right. So okay. the, the card pack is more, as I say, for, it's different ways of approaching the same thing. I mean, the A to Z dream dictionary is just, you know, it actually was first the element encyclopedia of 20,000 dreams, which was condensed to a paperback 
because these days the big doorstop encyclopedias don't work anymore for bookshops they want so I, I had the painstaking task of having to decide which dreams to go in there and it was so frustrating um but uh that's an a to z of as many symbols as as my word count would allow and the other wow. two are beautiful illustrated and i also done a dream journal because a lot of people said you know you keep saying write down your dreams can and so again um you know it's a, a, a trying to find it sorry it's this one it's beautiful oh, um, beautiful again another talented tan same talented artist who's just provided wonderful images and then you know a year of write down your dreams and also how to, how did the dream make you feel if you could draw this dream that's another way with dream recall draw it instead of write it down um you know give your dream a title what was the moon phase you know if, you, if you're into lunar living right just just ways to help you <laughs> that's you know. very cool so you've mentioned even in this in sharing with us about dreams um obviously you have you've had exposure to, you said, you know, you grew up in a family that was very um, spiritually minded around spiritualists. And then you also are, have worked with and collaborated with the science community mm -hmm. to support a lot of the work and the research that you do. And I guess yes. it's important for people to know, I mean, part of the reason you've written so many books is that you are, I mean, you're a researcher <laughs> and you have shared so much of what you've come to find for all of us, is that fair to say? Oh yeah, because I say my background is I have a, a degree from very blessed. I was at King's College, Cambridge, so that that's yeah, sort of in my blood to approach things in that way. And um, it was six years ago when a team of scientists at the Institute of Noetic Scientists gave me a landing page on their website uh, where saying you've read Teresa's books about precognition, about dreaming, about the afterlife. She expresses what we're researching. Mm. And they gave free gifts from their research. That was that actually meant more to me than anything. My publishers didn't understand why I was so happy, but for me, it's so this in this area, so many books are anecdotal, and that's great. But that's a personal opinion, and I just feel there needs to be more of what science saying here. It's very important to have that to to validate in a way. And to give it, um, because you know, all the critics with me is like, oh, this is all your imagination. It's hallucination. It's woo woo. That word, woo woo. Mm -hmm. And I've <laughs> I've tried to work with scientists to show that science and spirituality are so much closer than we think. Um, yes. And there is research out there now, and fascinating research on dreaming, on the possibility of an afterlife, on intuition, on precognition, on supernormal abilities on the afterlife you know I, well, published in journal. I do absolutely want to ask you about the premonition code because this is very fascinating but mm. because you um have done work with research specific to the afterlife i have to ask you this because when i've lost three friends in the last year but a lot of people that i also know like a lot of people have experienced loss it seems more so in this last year um and yeah, it's, it's been interesting. So I have to ask you about that. Could you tell us a little bit about the work and the research that you've done um, in this area? What is noetic? Is that what you called it? Noetic? noetic. If you could explain. Yes. What is that? Sorry. I, I, I assume. Yeah. Noetic is the in a world it's and unseen. It's a term for what is unseen and invisible in our lives and the role of the feelings, emotions, senses. And the Institute of Noetic Sciences was formed, I think, in the 70s by astronaut Edgar Mitchell. He flew to the moon and on his return to Earth, he had a transcendent experience, almost out of body. And he found that internal experience of interconnection and bliss more interesting and going to the moon so what was happening and he when he came down back to earth and retired he he formed the institute of noetic sciences and there's a team of scientists about eight or nine of them working there researching energy healing researching precognition researching afterlife and when i found out about them i was so excited and they're absolutely brilliant there there's a whole community down there and they're researching 
the supernormal. And actually, Dan Brown, Dan Brown The Lost Symbol, that uh, novel, was based on the Institute of Noetic Science team, the lead character in it, and the, all the res fascinating research they're doing into wow. the unconscious, the, the afterlife. And these are scientists. And mm -hmm. when I interviewed all of them, and uh, my question to all of them is, well, are you believers in the afterlife? Are you in, and, and all of them said, well, whether I am or not doesn't matter. I'm a scientist first. We look for proof. Yes. And what they're trying to do is to record all these extraordinary experiences, like you mentioned, astral travel, out of body, afterlife, intuition, etc., and collate it as evidence and then study it and do all their double blind studies or however they do it, you know. Yeah and publish it in, in medical and scientific and academic journals. And the, the research is out there. But the problem is it's so hard to understand the science sometimes. Yes. And so I wanted to try and make that science more accessible. And that's why I wrote The Premonition Code with Julia, because I found this woman who researches the possibility of time travel. Mm -hmm. She's a neuroscientist who, how cool is that? Researches time travel. Right. And the possibility of sensing the future knowing what's going to happen before it happens. She studies it scientifically. This is so interesting. Yeah, well, there's there's a whole, aside from um, the book and the research that has gone into the premonition code, there's also a website attached where people can essentially test themselves on um, <laughs> how well they can know yes. what images may pop up on the screen and these types of things. It reminds me of too, I believe, I always forget if it was in the movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? Or if it was the movie, <laughs> I Am. But one or both of them also showed scientific evidence of us being able to sense what may happen prior to it happening, whether it's it was something scary. It's called presentiment, actually, scientifically, which, um, you know, it, it, it studies show that when people are strapped up with heart monitors and brain, whatever, that they, they that the body actually senses the future before it happens mm -hmm. because um, um, the, the experiment was that people were shown random cards and some of these cards had random frightening images on it. And what they showed that it was way above chance that just before a random card, they didn't know which card was coming next. It was totally impossible for them to know. It was like the body sensed it. There was an increased heart rate, sweating, and it, was, it, it, it wasn't just oh, this is a coincidence, it was way above chance. Um, and there are plenty of studies to show that the body actually is the first place where the future is known. Isn't that interesting? That we need to listen more to our, what our body's saying. So is it kind of like, you know, even how we use the term, like I had a gut feeling or a lot of people, like we always say that I had a feeling, a feeling, a feeling, not yes. necessarily, you don't hear people. I mean, some people say, oh, I knew that, but it is very common to hear that. So with that in the work, if someone was trying to strengthen this ability, um, even just for, I don't know, I mean, in your opinion, what is the benefit of this ability really? But what are the ways that we can strengthen it? Well, the benefit of it, I'll do that. And then the ways to strengthen, the benefit of it is it can help us make better choices mm -hmm. because the future is fixed but we can alter it. I know that sounds like a contradiction, but I always say it's like if I held out um, a glass and dropped it, the future of that glass is to smash on the floor. However, with my other hand, I can catch the glass. I can change what's fixed. Mm -hmm. And these are all very big scientific concepts that I, I, you know, when I was working with Julia, the neuroscientist, sometimes I would be like, ah, I don't understand. This is so mind blowing. So that's the benefit. It can help us if we sense that the future that we're writing for ourselves is going to be dark, mm. we can take action, positive action, to create a different potential future. Like in Sliding Doors, that movie, you know, there's potential futures as well. So that's what I, I think the benefits are of. And also respecting our future self. We have an exercise in the book, which sounds nuts, but it's like shaking hands with your future self and, you know, being kind to our future self um, and, 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 and uh, feeling love for that future self, um, which is a, 
it's a strange concept, but it's, it's like respecting who we are tomorrow. Sometimes a wonderful exercise to do is to record a message today to the person you're going to be tomorrow, a really empowering, loving message, and then go and listen to it the next day. And when people do that, they actually feel better about themselves. But anyway, that's going on another thing. But the, be the ways to train this ability to sense the future, dreams, of course, plugging into your dreams, because sometimes dreams can hint at the future. I don't know if, if you've ever had this happen, that you have a dream and then suddenly the next day you think, I, I, I dreamt this, mm. I, you know, or, or you, you dreamt of someone you haven't seen for a while and then the next day they text you out of the blue. These mm. wonderful things, so dreams of course, gut feeling, tuning into your body much, much more, paying attention to how your body is trying to tell you something. Meditation, even if, Two minutes a day is enough. I'm not one for recommending hours of meditation. I don't go there, but just two minutes of clearing your mind and getting used to observing yourself. These are all ways to really power your precognitive ability. And again, also paying attention to your emotions and not identifying with your emotions, but sensing when these emotions are passing through you and what have they got to teach you because they're trying to tell you something just like your dreams are about what's going to happen in your future these are all ways that you can <laughs> you know train that precognitive muscle and that's where I came in because Julia does this brilliant scientific program on the website and I'm going to be honest here and I, I joke about this in the book it's so tough <laughs> it's for the super scientists and that's where I came in I, I give them more sort of the gentle well, this is how you do it from a not, because I'm not scientist. I studied religion at university. I'm not, I, I'm useless at science. So, you know, these are the sort of the gentle ways to do it. But the more mindful you are, the more um, uh, self, self care you have, and the more you tune into how your body's feeling and how you, you know, you'll understand your emotions, the more likely you are to sense the future before it happens, to be intuitive. Yeah. And again, just like I said in the book, they you do have a website connected to the book. So people can actually test this out for themselves. Good luck so, with that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I did it's years ago. I've, had, I've yeah, it's had this great. book for a long time. And I remember when I, you know, realized I was going to have a conversation with you. I was like, wait, I have that book. And then I remembered years yeah. ago going to the site and it was it was very challenging it's so very challenging. <laughs> but it's a scientific experiment really www.thepremonitioncode.com it is more like a scientific experiment because we're trying to get research on yes. what people above chance but it's purely scientific the the training and and the testing there's mm -hmm. no possibility of fraud or, or cold reading or any of these things which can, you know, it's a, a very scientific, rig rigorous test into the possibility of precognition. But even if you don't do very well on it, the fact that you're training yourself on that website is really positive because precognition, intuition, if you want to call it that, is a muscle. The more you train it, the better and better it's going to get. And mm -hmm. every mistake teaches you something. Yeah. about you know so don't don't give up if you don't do very well on it I mean I, I do rubbish on it and I'm actually quite an intuitive person but it's, yeah. it's really scientific um but the more you train it the better it's going to get well I know I only have a few minutes left with you so I want to make sure to ask you I would like to ask you about your book about angels before we go but just really quickly because I forgot to ask you this about the um the afterlife science how are they studying this? Is it a is it looking at people experience. who near death? Okay, it's near death experiences more than anything else. Of course, there was that big, amazing study in 2014 with Dr. Sam Parnia, where he studied thousands of near death experience stories. And I think Dr. Parnia is fascinating because he's a leading expert in resuscitation. And if you think about it, you know, resuscitation techniques are giving us these stories, which decades ago, these people would have died, but right. they're coming back now. We're being pulled back from the brink. And he actually is an atheist. He doesn't believe in an afterlife at all. However, he time and time again, the people coming back were having these stories and these stories had such striking similarities. So he, he being a scientist, 
felt they should be studied. And, there's, and, and the, the, the study he did in 2014 proved that consciousness, whatever that is, you can call mm -hmm. it soul, can survive bodily death by three minutes. Now, bodily and brain death, when everything's flatlined, because the person that came back was able to have accurate recall. He'd had what you say, an out-of-body experience and seen what was happening and could give details when he was actually dead. Yes. And that is so mind-blowing and it can't be ignored what's right. happening there that more on research is ongoing and Dr. Parnir is doing this, this spellbinding research into thousands and thousands of near-death experience stories um, and it's ongoing and we have so much more to learn but it's very, very exciting. So that's mainly how afterlife is researched. You can also study mediumship. Mm -hmm. People who say they can see dead people hear dead people and there is a lot of research into mediumship and that tends to be at the Windbridge Institute where a wonderful doctor lady called Dr Julia Mossbridge is testing mediums scientifically and she has been able to identify certain people who pass scientific tests that they are able to through a phone call where they can't see the person where they have no clues are able to give accurate details of, of the someone who has departed. Right. And again, this all merits research. What is going on there? We don't know. Is it telepathy? Well, if it is, that's just as fascinating as mediumship. Right. So, you know, there is research out there, but it's all hidden because the scientific community finds it all a bit alarming because it unsettles us. You know, we like to think of us as logical and rational beings, and this can't be possible, but why not? I mean, again, that's why I said at the very beginning that you have this phenomenal body of work and study and all of the things that you are researching. And, you know, it's interesting hearing a lot of what you've shared and even reading your book, The Premonition Code, because I um, came into this work not, I don't know, completely skeptical. So I can only go off of personal experience. And in all of these years, I mean, it's really cool, I think, to so many people now that science is in so many ways um, trying to mm, clarify a lot of this, yes. um, validate it for a lot of people. And hopefully, just like how you said, I mean, you studied theology, but the meeting of the minds in this, I think, is so important because I don't think you could, we wouldn't have a leg to stand on if it was solely scientific, because who would you be observing or studying if there weren't the people that were having these spiritual experiences so to speak right so it is very important for the two to find their way together to really um, help us all I believe understand just our overall functionality so it's very cool so speaking of that if we could just do a really quick pivot into um, one of your latest books and <laughs> it, it the truth about angels with all that we've spoken about, I, I just want everyone to know they can find more on your website because I'm sure they're gonna be like, what? She's into the, oh my goodness. Yes, go to her website. Um, and of course it'll be in the show description, but why a book about angels? Do you personally connect with them? Have you had experiences? Or what is this book about? Is it to help us understand? Yes. Well, 10 or oh. Ten, over 10 years ago, um, I was tasked by my publisher to collect true life stories of people who had seen angels. Or, okay. So I did that and I didn't think, you know, I just collated them like almost like an editor and gave my comments. That book went to the Sunday Times top 10 very fast and led to about 15 other angel on my shoulder, angel, <laughs> angel by my side, angel. But because basically people just kept writing to me about their angelic experiences. And I saw myself very much in the role of collector, collator, and treating these stories with respect, just saying, look, here they are, these stories in any other line of research, this would be data. So I saw myself as a data collector. Now the truth about angels, I mean, after a while, you know, I've done 15 angel story collection books, you know, that's, a ma you know, and of course these stories have a certain sim similarity. People find a white feather, they believe it's their beloved aunt in spiritual, etc. These are beautiful moving stories, very comforting and very healing. 
Um, so after I'd done about 15 of those, I moved on to other areas. I felt I'd done what I could. But The Truth About Angels was a very important book for me to write because I did notice with alarm over the years that a lot of people started to rely almost in a codependent way on mediums and psychics to connect them to angels, to connect them to dead people. I mean, spirits, because you could, could say that an angel is the spirit of a departed loved one. For me, the two are interchangeable. They're not these beings with wings. They can also be, and, and I, I, I began to realize that this was actually not very helpful um, because I firmly believe that we have the angel within us. So this more is more a book saying, look, stop seeking it outside through visiting psychics, healers, and mediums, and gurus. That has its place. It can be very helpful, but at the end of the day, find it within you, that connection to the afterlife. Here's what, it's also the truth refers to the science. So I try to have, a, I have a chapter on the science of the afterlife and the science of angels and what we know, but it is really a call for, find it within, really, because, too many people think that some teacher is going to tell them how to connect to the other side. Some guru is going to empower them. It's, it's all looking externally because spirituality for me, and especially as I get older, it's an inside out job, not an outside in one. So that's why, and it's actually probably, it's kind of like sort of me making a statement at the, after doing all this work with angel stories and saying, well, that's great all these people have had these angel experiences. It's great that somebody thinks an angel saved their life, or it's great that somebody saw an angel floating down from heaven and it healed them. How is that gonna help you? You need to have your own experiences and, and not put someone on a pedestal who says that they have seen an angel. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, for me personally, it's, you know, someone who says they've seen an angel and then or charge money to bless people, for me, is the opposite of spirituality. You know, I could be wrong, mm -hmm. but I don't believe that anyone is more spiritual than anyone else. No, I don't believe people are more spiritual than anyone else. Not at all. However, I do think it is, we're lucky that there are people that can teach us how to access that within ourselves. Yeah. I mean, even similar to your book. I mean, a book, yeah. a teacher, whatever can help us learn to recognize not just the this aspect that you're talking about with the angels, but really literally everything you've been talking about. So I think all of these things, once we recognize what we're really capable of, I think that draws up that curiosity that you mentioned earlier. You know, I think once people really, and even something as simple as you mentioning, um, we all dream. Right. I mean, it's not like something you have to, well, yes, you can learn to do it and recall it and, you know, dream in a particular way, like lucid dreaming. But once we start even just kind of looking at ourselves differently of like, oh, it's not just a dream and, oh, but really being curious about what am I experiencing in this state? I think that these things, the angels, the dreams, the, the afterlife, I think it, all kind of sparks a curiosity about ourselves, which I think sends people on a path of um, into spirituality. I think that's what it is. Like really bringing that into how, who am I? What am I? How do I work? How do we all work? Yeah. Absolutely. You're super wise. Um, and a great teacher can do that, can give you mm -hmm. the fundamentals, but the, the, the role of every teacher is to make their role redundant and to set yes. people free. Yes. That's what I'm saying. It's when it, people become trapped in, in dependency. That's what I was trying to, yes. to break free from and to think I can't cope without the advice of this person. I want to show, you know, the great teacher will give people the strength to believe in themselves and move on like, like a parent really, you know, um, yeah. th that's what, you know, you need to set, the people who follow you you free and and yeah. um i always say that you know there's that wonderful story isn't it when you go to heaven you won't be asked how much you followed or copied someone however wonderful that person was you'll be asked how true you were to yourself yes were you the best version of teresa or mm. yolanda you know you won't be asked were you the best version of, of 
what the teacher had in mind for you, but yeah. yourself. It's, 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 it's a return to self-love, that book, really. Yeah. Um, and say, get inspiration from all these things that are happening around you and listen to the advice of teachers. But then at the end of the day, it's all about you. That is really, really beautiful. And that's a beautiful way to really wrap it up again. I mean, it would take hours to really talk to you fully <laughs> and in depth about your body. I'm a serial working. writer. I'm not a serial killer. I'm a serial writer. No, <laughs> yes, really, truly. But I mean, it's all very fascinating. And um, lucky for us, there are topics that all of us are really, truly so curious about. So, you know, thank you not only for coming to share, but for writing all of these books to help us learn more, to have more understanding about just being human and <laughs> the different experiences that we can have and what it all may mean. And interesting, again, that, you know, you're pulling in this work with scientists and seeing what happens when the two realms come together. So Teresa, I just want to ask um, if you can share with everyone the best ways to contact you, website, social media, how do we find you? Oh, I'm on social media, Teresa Chung, author on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and www.teresachung.com. Okay, very easy. And of course, I will put all of the links so people can easily click and access. Um, because again, like I said, visit the site so you can go deeper into what Teresa has shared today. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm, it's my honor. Thank you very, very much. Okay, beautiful alchemist. I want to thank you again for tuning in to Reiki Radio this week and a very special thank you to Teresa Chung for coming to have this discussion with us, giving a lot of us a new way to look at our dreams and possibly explore them a little more deeply. And don't forget, Teresa is the author of several books. She wrote The Premonition Code, which is all about the science of precognition. She also has a dream dictionary and her latest book, which is The Truth About Angels. So again, go to her website if you would like to learn more about her work, what she's doing, um, what she's sharing with the world. And if you would like to join me and some other alchemists, some other energetic alchemists in just honing your craft around energy work, getting some group mentoring, be sure to join me and them in the alchemy circle. And you can learn more about that on my website, theenergeticalchemist.com. As always, I thank you so much for being here. I'll see you next week. And remember to always journey in love.